A hypochondriac once told his doctor that he had a certain fatal liver disease. Nonsense, said the doctor. You wouldn't even know if you had that. Because with that particular disease, there's no discomfort and there's no indicators of any kind. Oh my, the patient said, those are my symptoms exactly. <laughs> you ever worry about your health? Of course. I think it's pretty safe to say that we all worry about our health from time to time, especially when the pain is different from something that we've experienced before. But even worse, than an ache or pain in our body is to then watch a loved one who's hurt or in pain. When we watch somebody else that we care for go through a really difficult time, that kind of pain feels even worse. I mean, for most of us, it'll be our parents. And for some of us, it'll be a spouse. And sadly, many have had to walk through the pain of watching it happen to a child. More than anything, we want to take the pain away from them. That's how great the bond is between a parent and a child. First John 3 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The Bible calls God our Father. And so if we care about the pain our children feel, wouldn't God then, as our Heavenly Father, also care about our pain? I think so, right? Because when we're sick, that's when we pray the most, or when we ask for prayer the most, right? When, when we're not feeling well, we pray for God's help and God's healing. When someone we care about is in trouble health-wise, we pray a lot. So we must believe that Jesus cares about health issues. After all, the gospel stories are full of healings, Right? There's the healing of the leper, the demon-possessed men, the paralytic, the epileptic boy, the bleeding woman, the invalid at the pool, the daughter of Jairus, the man born blind, and of course Lazarus, who had died. It seems Jesus did a lot of healing. So he must have been concerned when people were not physically well. Healing was part of Jesus' mission that he reads in the scroll of Isaiah. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Bible records at least 37 miracles of Jesus, and many of them are healing of physical ailments. But rather than look at all of them, we're just gonna look at seven miracles that John records and maybe ask why John thought those seven were the most important, and hopefully what we can learn from them. Last week we looked at Jesus turning water into wine. John said that this was Jesus' first sign. And today we're gonna to look at the healing from Jesus in John 54. Here John writes, this is now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. John calls these miracles signs which makes us wonder, why call it a sign and not call it a miracle? Once there was a sign in our neighbor's yard and it said, dog for sale, eats anything, loves kids. This sign is supposed to communicate information. This sign could be saying two different things, right? Does the dog love kids? Or does the dog love to eat kids? Like always, I, I think every time we come across one of Jesus' miracles, we can simply read it and be blessed as a miracle story, or we can ask ourselves, what does John see here? Is there anything more going on here? What, what is this sign trying to tell us? The first sign was changing water into wine. We studied that last week. Jesus has power over things. He has the power to change those things, but more so, God has come to improve the emptiness of legalism and to replace it with the shed blood, which is complete and perfect. Here in John 4, Jesus shows us that his power goes even beyond that. At the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus is in Judea, and he decides to go to Galilee. Jesus is from Galilee. 
he grew up in a town called Nazareth, and the next town over is Cana, where the wedding took place. And as he's going there, he passes through Samaria. He talks to the woman at the well. The Bible says he stays there for two days, and then he sets out for Galilee again. John 4 says, after the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet was, had no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So what's going on here? Originally, there were not a lot of people on Jesus' side in his own hometown because everybody knew him. Everybody knew his family. They watched him grow up. Jesus said, you know, it's really hard to be a prophet in the town that you grew up in. That's understandable. But now he's been gone for a while and everyone welcomes him back. Why? Well, because everyone had heard about everything he was doing to make a, to make a name for himself. Jesus' time in Judea had been front page news. And now that Jesus has made a difference elsewhere, people in his hometown, they now see him in an entirely different light. In fact, the whole reason he left Judea was because he was becoming too popular. Jesus can't let this fame thing spread too quickly. Uh, you know, that's, that he has to let the timeline roll out a little slower, otherwise everything will, will happen too fast. And this is why he first goes to Samaria. It's, it's like dropping off the map. You know, it, it wasn't a place Jews ever went. And now Jesus goes back to Cana. Why? 46 says, so he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. I believe Jesus returns to Cana because he has unfinished business there. Just like he had to go through Samaria, he had to meet the woman at the well. He needs to return to Cana to meet this official. Where are Capernaum and Cana? Uh, Capernaum is a fishing town. It's located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Cana is a town located inland. So it's about 20 miles southwest of Capernaum. Now, first, this is not the same story as the Roman centurion who asks for healing for his servant, okay? The stories feel the same, just like we have two stories where Jesus feeds a multitude. We have two stories of a woman who washes Jesus' feet. But for as much as they sound the same on the surface, when you look at the details, you see that all these stories are different. The story in Matthew and Luke involves a Roman hecatatan harnix, <laughs> or a centurion, but in John's, he's called a basilikos or a nobleman. The Matthew and Luke story also say the healing is for a servant, right? Where John says it's for a son. Matthew and Luke also say the story takes place in Capernaum, but John says Jesus is in Cana and it's his son who's in Capernaum. We don't know uh, very much about this man. He's most likely rich. He's described as a nobleman. And in verse 51, it says he has servants. So. He is probably somebody who has everything they could possibly want, but that's only an assumption. And while it's true that money certainly can buy creature comforts and it certainly does take away a lot of worry, especially when you stress about what's coming next or tomorrow, but there are at least a couple of things money can't buy. Money can't buy health, certainly, Having a significant amount of money grants you better opportunities for health care, right? You have the ability to buy medicine, you have the ability to have doctors, but even with the latest doctors and drugs, there are diseases and things that just can't be fixed. Money can't also buy us more time. Time is a fixed commodity. We can't add to with any amount of money. So the only thing we can do is make the most of our time. Unfortunately, some people, most of their time is spent getting money. And then they don't have enough time to enjoy the things they purchase. Therefore, we have to find this balance between work and the activities that make us happy. Besides, we don't even know when our time will be. So it's better to enjoy the time we have.
So we have this concerned father. He comes to Jesus and he says, my son is sick and I'm running out of time. He's traveled 20 miles from Capernaum to see Jesus. So he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water to wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When the man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Sometimes Jesus' response seems harsh, doesn't it? But I don't know that Jesus is talking to the father at this point. Remember, Jesus had left his hometown because the people there didn't believe in him. But now he's performed some of these signs and wonders elsewhere. And now upon his homecoming, he's welcomed with open arms. It's almost like Jesus is saying, oh, wow, okay, now you believe. Now you accept me. Jesus places the question before them. Do they only believe because of the miracles? Do they only come to see the signs and wonders? Remember, I said that Jesus had just come from the woman at the well story, right? Is that a miracle story? No. The cool thing about that story is it's just a conversation. If we go back up and look at what John records for us, it says many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed for two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. The people in that town, they believe solely from his word and from the testimony of other people. That alone says something about their faith. But even more so, these people are Samaritans. The Samaritans are not pure-blood Jews. And so because of that, they're forced to live in a town away from everybody else. And pure-blood Jews won't even go directly through their town for travel. But in John's story, the Samaritans, ironically, they are leading the way in belief. In verse 49, the official says to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Can you hear it? The desperation. First, he says to Jesus, heal my son. Greek word, huios, which just means son. But the second time, the Greek word changes to pation, which is my little boy. This dad does not argue, does not defend his faith. He just begs Jesus to come to Capernaum. He says, Jesus, please come heal my little boy. He must get Jesus to Capernaum because Jesus is his last hope. Verse 50 says, Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. I think you and I have read this story so many times, we don't understand how strange this sounds. And this must have been totally unexpected both by the man and by the crowd that's watching. Jesus doesn't go. Jesus doesn't have to be nearby to help. He doesn't have to lay hands on him. He doesn't have to pray over him. He doesn't have to be in the same room as this person. He can just speak and make things happen. Who else can speak and make things happen? From any distance, Jesus says, go, your son will live. That's a powerful statement. And that statement is all this father has to go on. Just Jesus' word. Verse 50 says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Jesus' word was enough. A lot like John's first sign. Right? Remember last week we said not a lot of people knew that the water turned to wine. Only the disciples and the wait staff. And here again, the people of Cana, they're glad to see Jesus back. They had heard all the things that Jesus was doing. 
But nobody gets to see Jesus wave his hands or call light down from the sky. And nobody in Capernaum gets to watch Jesus ride into town promising a really big show. Jesus just quietly says to the Father, go and your son will live. And the Father believes. Verse 51 says, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This is now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. A beautiful miracle on the surface. We can read this story, we can be blessed, or we can look at the story that lies just beneath the surface. A man comes to Jesus who believes that Jesus has the power to heal. Jesus looks at the crowd and asks, do you all have to see a sign or a wonder to believe? I just got back from Samaria, your supposed enemies, and they all believed without any miracles. And this father says, I believe, come with me. And Jesus pushes back and he says, okay, if you believe, go without me. Trust my words that he is healed and go. And the, father, the father believes and he makes his return trip home. He believes what Jesus says and he goes his way. He's got a five or six hour walk ahead of him and it'll be dark by the time he gets home. But along the way, his servants find him and they give him the good news. They say, your son is well. The very thing that Jesus said was true. And he starts to put the pieces together. The servants authenticate the miracle and the time, that precise moment, the very time that Jesus had said, your son will live. And here's, here's the miracle. Jesus restores a life, right? Absolutely. He heals a body. And it was brought about very simply just by speaking. He pronounced, he will live, and he lived. And the text tells us the result. And he himself believed in all his household. As the father informed the family what happened, they all believed too. Have you been to Paris? I have not been to Paris. What if I told you that in Paris, there is this thing called the Eiffel Tower. Would you believe me? Why? Because you believe the people who've actually been there. You've seen pictures, right? 5.5 million people have posted pictures of themselves in front of the Eiffel Tower. You believe it, even though you've never been there, you've never seen it, you believe it exists. C.S. Lewis wrote, I have to believe that Jesus was and is God. And it seems plain as a matter of history that he taught his followers that the new life was communicated in this way. In other words, I believe it on his authority. 99% of the things you believe are believed on authority. The ordinary person believes in the solar system, atoms and the circulation of the blood on authority because scientists say so. Even historical statement is believed on authority. None of us have seen the Norman conquest or the defeat of the Spanish Armada, but we believe in them simply because people who did see them have left writings that tell us about them. In our conversation with Jesus today, we find a man who's come to Jesus because of the information that he heard about him. He comes not altogether knowing what to believe, but simply knowing that he has a need and nobody else can fill it. This is the picture of us, right? We come to Jesus trembling, hurting, not knowing, not understanding, but hoping. Jesus takes our faith right where we're at, but he doesn't leave us there. He takes us by the hand a little further. Does Jesus care about your health? See, I think this miracle says that he does. Jesus cares about all the things in your life, your health, your family, your job, your school, relationships, and he demonstrates his care for the rich man by healing his boy. But he's interested in even more than that. Because what happens at the end of the story is 
everyone's faith grows. Notice the man had faith that Jesus could heal. That's why he was there. But afterwards, the Bible says his faith grew. At first, this man has just crisis faith. Jesus is a healer, he's a miracle worker, and he says, Jesus, please come and heal my son. When do you think people pray the most? Probably when we need something, right? We don't always remember to pray when things are going well or when people are not sick, right? We pray when there's trouble. The man's request starts off like a lot of my own prayers. Jesus, I need you, come quick. And how does Jesus respond? Ugh, this is the only way I can get you to put your faith in me. It's faith, but it's crisis faith. Trusting in God for the things of this life. Anyone who's taken a test that they didn't study for, they know this kind of faith. They've prayed this kind of prayer. And there's a couple of problems with this kind of faith. First of all, when this crisis goes away, the faith goes away. And the flip side is, if the Lord doesn't answer your crisis problem, then you could lose your faith. That's the problem with crisis faith. It's, the de it's dependent upon. What have you done for me lately? And it's not the kind of faith that Jesus wants in your life. He doesn't want us to trust in him just for the things in our life. He wants, us to he wants us to trust him with our life. Jesus wants us to have a confirmed faith. See, the father thought Jesus had to be at the boy's bedside to be healed. But it turns out Jesus is bigger than that. And the same is true for you. You are not out of God's reach. Jesus, Jesus doesn't have limitations. He is the God of time and space. There, there is nothing that is too hard for him. There is no distance that is too great for him. But in the midst of this discussion about physical healing, please remember that Jesus cares even more about your faith. He cares more about your spiritual health. Jesus is looking to restore spiritual wholeness, even more than physical wholeness. God is not looking for people that hold to, well, seeing is believing. Prove it to me. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Earlier, the text said that he had taken Jesus at his word. Now it says that he and his household believe. What's the difference? What's changed? Well, now it's not just a belief that the boy will be healed. That no longer requires faith. That's a fact. Now the man has become a believer. He believes that Jesus is the person who he claims to be, the Messiah, Savior. And now, trusting in Jesus, he has witnessed his son pass from death to life. Is your faith growing into that kind of faith. You have more faith today than you did yesterday. More trust. Our faith is not meant to be static. It is something we experience once, but it doesn't remain constant. It doesn't, it changes. Our faith has to grow. We come to know God better as we come to know the word better. So what does this mean for you and I? It means we need to take a lesson from this father and take Jesus at his word. You know, one of the wisest men who ever lived wrote these words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. The answer to every problem in the universe is that we seek him first that we seek him with all of our being. And then he will reward, he will bless, he will perform the miracle. In Joshua 3, Old Testament story, the Israelites 
have been wandering in the desert for 40 years. Finally, God says, you get to go to the promised land. But they are all the descendants of the people who had come out of Egypt. None of these people had been in Egypt. They're all their descendants. These are the ones, uh, their parents were the ones who said, you know, we, we can't see how God could possibly work this out. Moses brought us all out here into the, into the desert to die, and they complained. And God said, because of your belly aching and because of your lack of faith in me, you are not going to enter the promised land. You will not take part in the blessing. You will not be victorious. And after you die, I'm going to allow your descendants to go into the promised land, but it'll still require faith. So Moses has died off with that generation, and now we have the descendants who are heading into the promised land. And then Joshua 3, God tells them to pack up everything, go down to the river, and begin to cross it. They're to break camp, pack up their goods, form a line, and march, and move down the banks. And then God says, you have to step into the water. That means they had to act. They had to believe before seeing. They had to make a commitment. They had to start that journey home. And it was only after they put foot to water that God parted the water. But they had to step into the water first. Same with us. We have to learn to take God at his word and go forward with the task, forward with the thing he's laid on our heart, even if we can't see a way forward. Because the reason why we're, we're stopped by obstacles of faith is because we expect them to be removed first before we try to pass through them. But Proverbs 3 says, if you would just move straight on in your faith, the path will be opened for you. But we stand still, and we're waiting for the obstacle to be removed when we ought to move forward and watch the obstacles fall. <sighs> Friends, don't, don't buy into the lie that in order to accomplish some great task for God, that you have to have all the resources before you start. If that's the mindset of a church, God will never bless them. Because God says he'll provide. But he never says it's going to be easy. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Don't be misled by believing that money or resources are going to help you accomplish God's will. What accomplishes God's will is people who are just simply crazy enough to believe that God will do what he says. What accomplishes God's will is faith. The nobleman's faith went from crisis faith to confirmed faith. And ultimately, it went to contagious faith because after the healing, he shared it with everybody else and they believed. The same God who parts the Jordan River and allows people by faith to walk across the river on dry ground, that same God healed a nobleman's son who was 20 miles away. Those people believed they put their foot to the path, and God cleared the way. He will make a way when there seems to be no way. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, there are those listening even right now who are focusing so much on the obstacles that lie ahead, the objects that keep us from our goals, from joy, from faith. Lord, we would just ask that you would give us the courage to step out in faith, to do the thing that you are asking, 
to make that journey, to place our foot on the path, to place our foot in the water, and to believe that your hand is powerful, to believe that you can do all things. Give us more faith. Grow our faith. Increase our faith. Transform our faith into confirmed faith that we might live for you each day. We thank you for all of your good graces and blessings. Amen. Hey, well, thanks for coming out and uh, being a part of this Sunday morning with us. Of course, I'm going to invite you to come to church, to be here in the room with us. We have two services every Sunday. We have one at 930. It's a traditional service. We're going to have a choir. We're going to sing hymns that you recognize. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We'll do responsive readings. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Please come casual. Come however you feel the most comfortable. We also have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.